Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions or comments electronically at any time by using the chat window located to the right of the slideshow presentation. Underneath it, you'll also find a window labeled files where you may download the handouts for today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, Mr. Chris Hund. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Chris Hund, Senior Director with the AHA Center for Health Innovation, bringing you this month's AHA Team Training monthly webinar. Uh, I'd first like to start by thanking you all for taking time out of what I'm sure is an incredibly busy day, and I'd like to thank you uh, not only personally and from the team here, but from everybody in the American Hospital Association for doing what you're doing, for being really on the front lines of everything that's going on right now. So my heartfelt thanks and, and applause to all of you for keeping us safe and, and being out there at the front lines. Um, I feel like today is going to be very, very relevant. Uh, we honestly didn't plan it this way, I promise. But we're talking about resiliency today. And we're talking about how to keep yourself, uh, you know, and to work toward a resilient state to, to be a healthier and more engaged team. Uh, and, I, you know, I, like I said, we didn't plan it this way, but I think it's going to be something that you should be able to use right now uh, with what you're going through. Rules of engagement, as always, the audio for this webinar can be accessed in two different ways. Uh, you could do it through the phone, and if you're listening through your phone, please mute your computer speakers, otherwise you get some very strange echoey feedback. Or you could do it through your computer, which uh, is a great way to do it if you have a strong internet connection. Uh, so that's the two ways to listen in. As always, we're going to be doing a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So please chat your questions in the chat box here on the right, and we'll put together a nice, coherent, ordered Q&A uh, for the, the end of the session. If there are questions we don't get to, please send them to uh, the uh, AHA team training email address, which I'll give you again in a second, and that will be the best way for uh, us to get the questions answered for you after the webinar. To receive one continuing education credit hour for this webinar, uh, this counts for CME, CNE, uh, pharmacy, allied health, it, it covers everything. It's a joint accreditation. So to do that, make sure that you have created a Duke OneLink account. We work with the, with Duke University for our continuing education. And instructions can be found in the file pod, which is uh, at the bottom of your screen. You could also email teamtraining at aha.org with questions about this. Uh, you must update your mobile number before you text in the code. So just make sure it's the right mobile number that you have in their system. If you've already set this account up, you don't have to do it again. Then text the number on the screen here with the SMS code Y-U-F-F-E-W within 24 hours of this webinar. Uh, we only have that window open for 24 hours, and you'll receive credit at that time. All right, some upcoming team training events. Uh, so because of the COVID-19 situation, uh, we are uh, currently not doing any of our Team Steps courses that we normally do. Uh, we're going to resume the courses this summer. Uh, there's more information on our website about that. The National Conference, which is in June, is still moving forward as planned. We are going off of the advice of the American Hospital Association, which is constantly monitoring the situation, and so... If anything changes, we'll let everybody know right away. But right now, we're still moving forward. Our next webinar is on April 8th, so in about three weeks or so, and it's about addressing disruptive behaviors in healthcare. Uh, so please register for that right now if you're interested. So here's our contact information again. Uh, AHA Team Training uh, website is aha.org slash team training. And our email is teamtraining at aha.org. Uh, so send us any messages you might have. 
We're here to help, here to talk about anything you need, both along the lines of registering for things or giving assistance and also giving advice if you have any questions around how to work as a team in this, these times. So please get in touch with us. Okay, today's pre presenters, uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Robert Smith. Uh, Dr. Bob, as we all lovingly call him, uh, is the director of the Medical Staff Assistance Program at the Metro Health System, which is in Cleveland, Ohio. I honestly, again, can't believe that this is working out the way it is, but I can't imagine a better person to be able to talk to here while we're going through the situation that we're going through. I, I feel like everybody needs somebody like Dr. Bob in their life. He's a phenomenally intelligent and caring individual, and so I'm very, very uh, excited for you to get to hear from him today. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you, Dr. Bob. Thank you, Chris. And I want to thank the AHA for giving me this opportunity to share. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to jump right in because we have a long way to go and a short time to get there. Uh, we're going to talk about resilience and team steps. Um, I want all of you to begin thinking of bringing those two together. Rather than seeing team steps as simply a way to build a team, think of it as building a resilient team, a team that's able to cope and adapt and support one another through difficult times. And that's what I want to focus on, and that's going to be sort of the message that I want you to take home and take to your teams. So our objectives are to identify signs and symptoms of burnout. Um, again, as Chris said, before we started this, the, the focus was burnout, the traditional burnout that we've all been struggling with. But we'll talk about how that's expanded and then become even more intense right now. Uh, we'll talk about causes and sources. Um, strategies for intervening, and ways to combine team steps and strategies that we can use within an organization and integrate those with um, resilience tools. So many of you kind of wonder, well, so why talk about burnout? Well, here's just a little bit of what has occurred in the last year in many of the journals throughout the United States. Um, just about every healthcare profession um, is struggling with staff within their areas, struggling with feeling either disillusioned, burned out. Um, we've, we're now talking about moral injury. We're talking about exploitation. But everyone is feeling the pressure of working in healthcare and the demands that are placed upon us to do more with less. Then we take what was already present, and we now have this new situation with the coronavirus or COVID-19, and everyone concerned about how do we manage our patients and take care of their needs and also take care of ourselves, our staff, our families, when so many things are occurring. I was just sharing with Chris earlier that coming in the hospital today, all of our staff are now being screened. They're taking our temperature. And if anyone has a certain temperature, which we've used as a cutoff, those persons are not allowed to come to work. They have to go home. We've also taken a large percentage of our workforce, and we're having them work from, from home. Uh, so far, we've not had to um, tell anyone that we don't have work for them and that they won't get paid. Everyone's getting paid. Everyone's still um, serving some function within the hospital. But as we know, many persons now are struggling with, will there be income? Will we have our job a week, two weeks, a month from now? So when we think about burnout in particular, the stress, there are a couple of questions we can walk through um, just sort of to take a look at yourself. Do you try to meet everyone's expectations and needs? Do you get to the end of a hard day at work and wonder if you've made a meaningful difference? you identify so strongly with work that you often lack a reasonable balance between work and your personal life? Does your job vary between manageable and chaos? At times, do you feel that you have too little control over your work? And do you just feel that you're beginning to get a handle on things and a new change or initiative is announced? 
as you notice as I went through each of those, the persons along the bottom disappeared. What we find is that as I go through this list with groups of people, that more and more people can identify with those traits. Um, if you do, that does not mean that you're burned out, but what it does mean is you're on the, you are at risk or you're on the road to potentially being burned out. Those questions come from a number of surveys that are around the country, and they point out characteristics that we need to be aware of. So what is burnout? Well, it's a loss of enthusiasm, feeling cynical, and questioning whether we're actually accomplishing anything anymore. Bottom line, when healthcare professionals begin to feel burnt out, they begin to question, did I make a mistake by becoming a nurse, a physician, a PA, an advanced practice nurse? They begin to question. They begin to wonder, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I looked forward to doing. This isn't rewarding and fulfilling. And so the World Health Organization now recognizes burnout as a disorder. They define it as an emotional reaction to work-related stress. So we're looking at psychological, emotional reactions to ongoing stressors at work that lead us into a sort of a spiral of going down. And so the question becomes is how do we support ourselves and support our teams and help reduce and prevent burnout? Now, when you think about burnout, certainly we know about the productivity and the reduction in performance, but really it's the personal issues that concern me the most. When individuals become burned out, we begin to see changes in their relationship, abuse of alcohol and drugs, an increase in depression, and a risk of suicide. In fact, if we take a look at the research, what we find is that among physicians, the rate of suicide is now at the highest rate we've ever seen in history. In fact, it's twice the general population, and last year over 400 physicians committed suicide. The rate of depression among physicians is extremely high. In this survey, it was 39%. To put that in perspective, the general population has an incidence of depression of 7 to 9%. And it's not just physicians. Whoops, let me go back. It's not just physicians. If we take a look at ICU nurses, 24% of them have identified with symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And primary care nurses have symptoms of burnout, particularly emotional exhaustion, of 23 to 31%. So again, the incidence is extremely high. And it's not just among those who are currently practicing. We also have data to show that those individuals who are in training, our medical residents, also are being affected by our current healthcare system. In 2015, they did a study that demonstrated that 21 to 43 percent of residents reported significant signs of depression. In a study during that same period, from 2000 to 2014, they found that suicide was the leading cause of death among medical residents, a total of 66 suicides. So here's the issue. Burnout's not new. In fact, it was first discussed in 1974. The reason for that is it's not a simple target. There's not one systematic issue that is causing burnout among our staff and our trainees. In fact, it's a moving target. And we can't view it as a problem with a solution, but rather we need to see it as multiple 
problems that are ongoing and ever-changing. And so the issue becomes not of fixing a particular problem so that it's resolved, but rather fixing a problem, maintaining and sustaining that solution, and preparing for the next problem that we'll encounter. Supporting this position, there are several articles. I'm going to go through two of them today. The first one is from JAMA. Um, it talks about a charter on physician well-being and it's by Larissa Thomas and her staff. This charter focuses on a number of things that we would expect. Foster a supportive culture, advocate for policies that enhance well-being, build supportive systems, develop engaged leadership. All of those are about getting our system to be receptive, understanding about well-being, and thinking about supporting individual departments as they adapt. But then notice what comes next. Optimize highly functioning interprofessional teams. Again, we'll talk about this more in a moment, but that's team steps. Developing, supporting, optimizing interprofessional teams. Anticipating and responding to emotional challenges. The only way we can know what is challenging is if we talk to our frontline staff. They're the ones who are doing the work. They know where the stress points are. And most often, they have a good idea of what are the things that we can do in order to address those stress points and what changes we need to make. We also need to prioritize mental health care and practice and promote self-care. So the next article builds upon this, this one by Shanna Felt, and it talks about executive leadership and physician well-being, organizational strategies. Well, what's important here is we do need the system to recognize, support, and embrace that there are things that we need to do within the hospital and within our healthcare and within our ambulatory um, clinics to make changes. And they're going to be specific to those areas, but we need leadership support and resources. If we simply keep talking about resilience training and helping individuals be more um, adaptive, coping more effectively, we're going to have a negative response. Um, persons are going to look at us and say, you're simply looking at me and either, either suggesting that it's my fault that I'm not coping well enough, that I'm not adapting, that somehow I'm flawed as an individual. Or they're going to feel, you're just trying to build me up so that you can keep dumping more on me. So it's really important that this is a two-prong approach. Yes, we want to support and enhance the individual and their well-being and their ability to cope but we also have to look at the stress points within our systems and develop strategies to make those better. I thought that this was particularly important. Although general principles can be established, variability makes a challenge for executive leaders to effectively address burnout at the enterprise level. Many of the challenges and solutions are local. I really want to underscore that. It is very unlikely that we are going to implement system-wide changes within a healthcare organization <clears throat> that are going to reduce and address burnout. The causes of burnout in the emergency department are different than the causes of burnout in ambulatory care, are different than the causes of burnout in the cancer center, labor and delivery. Each area has its own challenges. And even if there are some overlap, like let's say that it's documentation or needing additional nursing staff, the documentation needs are still going to be different between each of those departments. And the types of nurses and the times that we need them are going to be different. So each time we need to go to a local level. And that requires engagement and empowerment of our frontline staff which, again, I believe is a major 
sort of benefit of team steps. So I'm not going to go through these. Clearly, there are a large number of factors that can contribute to burnout. Clearly, documentation, staffing, patient volume, all of those are key things that all of us encounter. But, again, what I would encourage you to consider is, even though we may know that one of those is across multiple areas, the specific solution is going to be unique and can only be identified and clarified if we talk to the frontline staff. So those of you who know Team Steps, build upon it. If you already have that within your organization, think about ways to increase communication, to increase mutual support, particularly during this time with the coronavirus. Um, people are frightened. People are overwhelmed. Um, people are having their duties reassigned and changed. Um, it's really important that we work together as a team. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Team Steps, perhaps this is a time to begin thinking about learning about the tools and strategies related to Team Steps. Because what it does is it teaches the very basics that are necessary for high-functioning, high-quality teams. Leadership, situation monitoring, mutual support, communication, specific tools in each of those areas that you can use to build your team. And again, when you think about burnout, the literature has shown us over and over again that one of the key factors in helping people to remain resilient and avoid burnout at work, the relationships they have with their coworkers. When those relationships are positive and supportive, teams do much better, individuals do much better. When teams are splintered, when there is conflict, disorganization, um, poor performance, then what we find is individuals feel greater levels of burnout. So, again, I don't want to overdo the team steps part, but I want you to know that this is an evidence-based program. If you use these tools, it truly can help both with the patient safety, quality of care, high-quality teams, but also staff engagement, job satisfaction, retention, and reduction in burnout for the individual staff members. So to just give you a quick example of what we've done at Metro Health, we started our journey seven years ago with Team Steps. <clears throat> we have now trained all 7,800 of our employees. Um, as we went along and we completed training within a department, um, a division, a unit, we identified practical teams, groups of people who work together around the care of patients within an area, and then we formed action councils. The councils were our way of sustaining Team Steps and engaging our frontline staff in performance improvement, quality improvement, enhancing patient safety. Of course, the byproduct of that is they're engaged, they're empowered, they're given a voice, and they're able to make changes at the local level to improve their processes. What we've found is that we now have over 18 action councils within our hospital that meet either monthly or bimonthly. <clears throat> they're chaired by frontline staff. They're interprofessional. There's participation by leadership, but leadership does not direct or chair the meetings. And they address four areas um, as their charge, patient safety, patient experience, staff engagement, and improving our processes. <clears throat> Again, all things that are beneficial to the patient, but also beneficial to the staff. What we have found is when we have done our pre and post measures, staff, after that we've implemented team steps, and after the action council has been um, implemented, have found that the level of 
staff morale and engagement is significantly enhanced and burnout is lower. So again, I want to make sure that we're doing a two-prong approach here. We have to look at our team. We have to work in building them and supporting them. But we also need to look at the individual and develop strategies to support them and help them. So there are things that you can do within your organization. I'm part of our employee assistance program. We actually created a medical staff assistance program. So what I do <clears throat> is I take care of the 1,400 medical staff. So our physicians, interns, residents, fellows, nurse practitioners, um, PAs, all of those that fall under our definition of medical staff, I provide support. We also then have an employee assistance program that's available to all of our other staff. And in working with them, we provide individual support. We work with individual groups, within departments. Um, but our goal is to enhance and support them um, with any kind of personal or professional problems. We also do psychological debriefing when critical incidents occur and people are struggling. We meet with them, process what occurred, provide a safe environment where they can share their thoughts and their feelings and sort of work through um, whether it's a patient death or some other type of critical event. Um, we also do short center rounds. Uh, we started doing those several years ago. Um, if you are not unfamiliar with short center rounds, I would encourage you just to put that in your um, uh, list of things that you're going to do after this uh, webinar and, and look it up and take a look at it. It's a rounding process in which staff talk about themselves and their reaction to a particular clinical case. So it's not an M&M. It's not a review of a case in detail, but rather a discussion of a case and how it impacted the medical staff who worked with that patient and that patient's family. And then we've also begun doing resilience training um, within our organization, but again, helping our leadership to understand that we will work with our individual staff to build resilience, but you have to support us as we identify things within our organization that need to be changed. So when we think about resilience, I want to emphasize an area called positive psychology. Um, this is an area that's relatively new. Um, it's the study of human beings and focusing upon strengths rather than weaknesses, focusing upon um, enhancing well-being rather than addressing pathology. Um, and this is an area that has gotten a lot of attention in recent years. and is tied directly to resilience and our overall well-being. So resilience, we've got a couple of definitions here. Um, the process of adapting in the face of trauma or tragedy, coping with stress, adapting to change, managing emotions. So resilience is really about our individual ability to respond in a constructive way to whatever is in front of us whether it is something very um, minor, like not getting the promotion that you hoped, or something major, like the coronavirus. How do we adapt? How do we cope? How do we deal with the various things that occur in our personal lives? So positive psychology has posed a theory of well-being called PERMA. It emphasizes positive emotions, which we typically think of as happiness, joy, love. But then it adds to those positive emotions and talks about engagement, positive relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And again, I can't go through all of these today, but if you're interested in this, there's a series of authors who've talked about this, and probably one of the most significant is Martin Seligman out of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, there are a number of books that have been written. But the key with this slide is to think in terms of our well-being is not just about am I happy, but more 
Am I fulfilled? Does my life have purpose and meaning? Do I have connections with others that are rewarding and really fulfilling to me in my day-to-day -day life? And those, I think, become very important when we're looking at burnout because so often people are saying, I've lost a sense of meaning, i lost a sense of purpose, I feel isolated and alone. I don't feel like I'm really accomplishing anything that makes a difference. And that's where we have to step back and we have to re-examine and take a look at what do I need to do to take care of me. And it may be that the system that you're in is a major source of that burnout. But if we are realistic, we are ultimately responsible for our individual well-being. And if that system is not responding, if we've pulled together, if we've given them important feedback about the systems that are um, not functioning well, that are too demanding, that are requiring so much that we are now not healthy, we're suffering, and that system doesn't respond, then you have to step back and look at yourself and say, I'm sick, I'm not doing well, this is the cause, they're not willing to change, then I have to change. It comes back to me. And I'll never forget that my one mentor said years ago, sometimes we have to vote with our feet. And if I'm in a spot in life that's not right for me, then maybe I need to walk away. And that's not an easy thing to do, and I'm not encouraging people to walk away from health care. But I think that we have to first find our voice. We have to help administration understand what our sources of stress are. But if ultimately we do those things and you are burned out and you are depressed and you are disillusioned and, and then heaven forbid you're suicidal, it's time to step away and take care of yourself. So I'm going to focus on one of the most important aspects of positive psychology, the interaction between our mind and our brain. This first little slide here is just sort of interesting. We have 100 billion neurons, 500 trillion connections. And if you all just take a deep breath for a moment, in that moment, there were one quadrillion signals that just went in your mind, through your mind. Our brain is amazing. And there's some things I need you to keep in, in the forefront of, of your understanding of how the brain works. As the brain changes, the mind changes. If something happens to the structure of my brain, my experience of life will be altered. If I suffer a brain injury, I will have difficulties with concentration, attention, memory. I may have mood swings. I may have impulsivity. My whole life experience will change, and it will affect my relationships and my work. We all know that. But now let's go to the next one, which is focused on neuroplasticity. I can, through conscious effort, focus and practice, change the structure of my brain, which in turn will change my life experience. Based upon what I focus upon, what I think about, what I practice, I can create neuropathways within my brain. I can strengthen areas of my brain and change my life experience. Positive psychology relies upon neuroplasticity and the understanding that we can change the structure of our brain. It focuses on things like emotional intelligence, using our signature or character strengths, mindfulness, gratitude, flow, awe. All of these are about what we focus on, what we think about, what we practice. If we do these things, and there are a number of strategies and tools within the area of positive psychology that build resilience, we experience 
significant improvement in our mood and our overall well-being. So I want to go over one tool that you could practice and that you can share with your staff. It's called Three Good Things. It was developed by Martin Seligman, and it's really very simple. You basically ask yourself to identify three good things that happened in the last 24 hours. What was your role in making it happen? And what was the positive emotion that you experienced related to that good thing? And you do it every day. And for those of you who are willing to do this, do it for a minimum of 30 days and see what happens. It's all based upon neuroplasticity. You can do it any time of the day. You can do it alone. You can do it with your family. You can do it with your children. Here's what you can experience or what you can expect to experience. During the first week, you're going to find it challenging. It's a new habit, it's something new that you're going to do. You have to remember, have a pencil, paper, write it down, talk about it. I can't come up with three good things. So I have to come up with three good things. I've only got one good thing. Struggle through it. Try to make it work. Second week gets easier. Third week, it starts to be fun. The fourth week is where the real impact occurs. Based on neuroplasticity, what starts to happen is you're changing the neural pathways within your brain. You are training your brain to be aware and responsive to positive things happening in your environment that most likely you were missing or overlooking before. The result is an improvement in mood, an improvement in overall well-being. The key thing that I point out to everyone is it's free, it's easy, and it doesn't take much time. And yet, this simple positive psychology tool can change your overall outlook and your mood. Now, key things about some of the tools within positive psychology, you can use them at work. We have a number of people who begin their meetings each day with, let's go around the room and everyone share one good thing that happened in the last 24 hours. Actually, have some physicians who begin their rounds with the residents by saying, let's go around and everyone share one good thing that's happened in the last 24 hours. So let's circle back to coronavirus, because I know that we're running short on time. So what we want to be aware of is that this is impacting people on multiple levels. And so even individuals who were not burned out before may be feeling the significant impact of an illness that we can't see but think of it this way. There's a threat that we can't see, that we don't fully understand, and that we can't stop. When we experience that kind of threat, automatically our emotions start to race and jump from fear to frustration to anger to depression. Those are normal emotions and normal reactions. I have some suggestions. I think we need to help everyone within our teams to stop, gather information, evaluate, and then act. Because, you see, the things that people don't always understand is emotion follows thought. Although it may feel like our emotions sometimes just come out of nowhere, they follow thought. So let's say I'm walking down the hallway, and there's a person behind me, and they bump into me very hard, and I fall to the ground. If my first thought is, they shoved me down. Well, now I'm feeling angry and frustrated and upset, and I'm getting up, and I'm unprepared to challenge them. Why did you push me down? If, however, my thought is, oh, they must have tripped and fallen against me, 
I'm now experiencing compassion, and I turn, and I want to make sure, are they okay? Same situation, and yet my thoughts lead to different emotions and different actions. So right now it becomes important that we understand that fear and anxiety right now are responses to our thoughts. And fear and anxiety are intended to make us cautious and to slow down, but we don't make decisions based on fear. Again, we want to stop, slow down, make sure we've got all the information we need, and then put together a plan. So here are some key things that I would encourage you to share with your staff. Yes, we want to be informed but we don't, do not need to be over-informed. I know people who are checking their phone and checking their um, different websites every five to ten minutes. There's no need for that. Also, make sure that people use official sources. We don't need rumor. We don't need misinformation. And we probably only need to check them several times a day. The other thing that many people do is they fall into the trap of, well, what's the worst possible thing that could happen? Holy smokes. Talk about creating panic and undue anxiety. We want to redirect ourselves to think about the most likely scenarios. Given my circumstances, given where I'm at, given What's happening around me? What's the most likely scenario? And how do I prepare and plan? So many people are calling in and asking me, you know, well, you know, what, what if I get the coronavirus? What's going to happen to me? And what's going to happen to my family? And it's like, well, wait a minute. Before we jump to the conclusion that you're going to have it, let's do a little bit of a, you know, quick, quick survey. Have you interacted with anyone who is positive? Do you know anyone who's positive? Um, is there any reason to think that, you know, you've spent time with someone who's positive? For many people right now with the um, physical distancing that we're doing, their answer is no. Well, if that's true, if you don't know that you've been at all exposed, let's not be thinking about all the worst possible scenarios. Let's refocus and spend our time and energy on positive steps. And, yes, be informed. Know the, the steps to, to how to get um, screened if you need to be. Be prepared in case of a possible quarantine. But don't over-prepare. We've got so many people who are over-preparing right now, which is a real problem. Um, manage the risk. We all know the things that you need to do. But I want to focus on limit your physical contact, but not your social contact. And I know we're talking about social distancing, but don't discontinue social contact. Right now, we need to be con connected with our family and our friends. Call them, text them, email them. Do positive, constructive things. Chris was mentioning that his kids are, are, are writing letters to their grandparents and drawing pictures. And do yes, those are the things we have to do. We need to be connected with one another. And most of all, we have to demonstrate patience, compassion, gratitude, and love. Those are the foundations of positive psychology. That's what it's really all about, how we treat one another and how we get through this together. I'd be happy to answer any questions with the remaining time. Thanks, Bob. That, that was really, really wonderful and incredibly timely. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I know everybody really appreciated it as we were watching the chats go by. Um, so thank you. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in uh, today and then also things that have sent, been sent in over email uh, over the past week. Um, real quick, uh, can you go over the instructions for the three good things again? That was somebody had asked for that after the slide had gone by. Could you just kind of give an overview of, of how you go about and do that? Absolutely. So there's just three steps. 
What are three good things that happened in the last 24 hours? Write down those three things. Then next to each one, write what was it that you had done to make that happen. The key here is, is if you did something specific, you can do it again and make it happen again. That's wonderful. If you did nothing and this wonderful thing happened to you and you had no um, involvement in causing it, then feel gratitude. How wonderful that this good thing just fell in your lap and you didn't have to do anything to make it happen. The third step is to identify the emotions related to each of those things. And you do it once a day for three good things. And actually, there's apps out there that you can put on your phone to, to, to keep track of your three good things. I, I do that every morning. Um, but again, if you do this on an ongoing basis, and I've got people who are telling me all the time, we do this at dinner. Um, and, and my teenager is talking to me for the first time. <laughs> so, you know, think about creative ways to use this um, to, to foster um, positive things within your family and, and at work. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, you said you used an app for that. Is, it, is there one that you recommend? Hang on a second. It's called What's Good. Thanks. What's Good, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, oh, and I don't own any stock in it or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sure you don't. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, all right. So let me, let, me, let me cycle back a little bit here uh, to get some earlier questions, and then we'll get some of these that are coming in now. Um, Taking a real step back, uh, somebody had asked earlier on when you had your suicide rate of uh, physicians up, um, they've received some questions when they bring up these statistics because occupations are not collected on death certificates. So wh where can they grab this information? Where can they refer these folks they're speaking to uh, around this data? So if you just put in... Um, Physician suicide in your um, search engine, it'll come up with all the research data. Um, right now, there's there's a ton of data. Again, we don't know if we're underestimating um, because causes of death are not always real, real clear. Um, but sure. where we're certain, um, we're now looking at around over 400 a year. Uh huh. That's a lot. Um, since you've begun your work. Uh, with Team Steps and, and your, your, all of the things you've done at Metro Health. You know, what are some of the, I know this is a long list actually, but what are some of the big improvements you've seen? And, uh, I think, you know, especially around this kind of engagement and, and resilience of your staff and have you measured this through a culture survey of some sort? So what we've done is, um, each of the, Team Steps Action Councils does quality improvement projects um, where they're, again, looking at one of those four areas that I outlined. They then gather pre- and post-measures, and they take a look at, at the improvement. Um, we've seen improvement in our central sterilization. We've seen improvement in our ambulatory clinics. Um, and some of the changes that people make are very small. Um, we modified the way that patients register when they come into our ambulatory clinics to make it more private, um, which is better for the patients. Um, but it ended up also being more manageable and a more effective system uh, for our staff. Um, we've made changes in our OR um, in terms of how we make referrals from the PACU to the floor. And we made changes in our um, electronic medical record, EPIC, so that the physician making the determination of patients appropriate for the floor only has to go to one epic screen to get the information they need, where prior to their project, that position would go to 12 to 15 screens. Um, and so on and on. We, we are looking at trying to solve the frontline challenges that the staff encounter day after day. And we've made it so that it's not just um, our clinical staff. We've also trained our non-clinical staff. So 
Um, our finance and IT departments um, have all been trained in Team Steps, and they have action councils, and they take a look at their processes as well. Um, we have done um, our culture survey, and what we find is where Team Steps is the strongest, then our morale is also the highest and um, a sense of culture um, of support and nurturing and engagement is higher. Uh, so we do have some of that data as well. Thanks, Bob. Um, before we go on, I saw that Jen posted some links for the app, and then she also posted uh, the resilience tools from our partners with Duke. Um, so Dr. Brian Sexton has done a lot of this work. I believe that you can still do the you might still be able to do three good things through his study that he's been uh, doing uh, for some time. So uh, check that out, too. Uh, so multiple ways that you can kind of come and get this. Um, when you're talking about the councils, the action councils, there's a question that just came in and also another question that said, earlier on that said, can you explain the you know differences and similarities between your action councils and uh, the IHI's Joy and Work groups. So let's, let's do that first, and then we'll ask another question about the action councils. So I'm not familiar with the IHI. Not a problem. Um, <laughs> I think the, the, the real purpose of these groups, though, of these action councils, is to not only keep the flame alive and make sure that people continue to stay trained, new employees stay trained, but it's really to make sure that you look through everything going on in the department through a lens of teamwork and communication using Team Steps, right? Absolutely. In fact, our, our yeah. Team Steps program is now under quality and patient safety. And so, you know, we're, we're using our action councils to ongoing evaluation of our processes to ensure patient safety quality, um, and then the result, of course, though, is, is we're making our processes better, staff is um, more satisfied and, and less burned out. And how do, how do folks find time to be in that council? They're, I'm assuming since it's such a big priority with your leadership, they're given that ability to step away to serve on these councils, correct? They have. Now, the, the problem, of course, is, is if right now everything will be on hold for a period of time. Um, and during our trauma season, um, our ED and then our um, OR and then PACU find it more difficult to meet, and they may spread out their meetings. Um, but all the chairpersons have been very, very supportive and have given protected time to the staff on the, the action council so that they can meet. Sure. Okay. That makes sense. Um, shifting gears, um, back again, uh, somebody had recently asked, um, how do you deal with a persistently negative staff member? Someone that, you know, you know, if you, you ask them, um, you know, for three good things, say, says, you know, uh, <laughs> nothing good at all, hope you walk away, my one good thing will be that you don't have to be the guy. You know what I mean? How do you deal with that real negative <laughs> person that's it's hard to it's a hard hard nut to crack. Yeah, I think it depends upon what your role is. So if you're a um, team member and you have a relationship with this person and you're able to be candid and, and share with them, you may point out to them that they are negative and that that is um, offensive. It pushes people away. It's um, a, a characteristic that they have that actually they could change. If you do not have a relationship with them and they're just negative, they're sort of a thorn in your side, I would encourage you to avoid them. And I'll tell you why. Right. Um, what we know is that if you take two people and put them together, and one is positive and one is negative, it is more likely that the negative person will pull down the positive person. And we've just seen that over and over again in, in various studies. Um, it is important that we surround ourselves by individuals who are positive and constructive, um, that we minimize the time that we spend around people who are very negative. If you're a supervisor, 
um, what you may do is meet with that individual and coach them. Um, maybe even make that part of their professional plan because it can be um, written into their um, performance improvement plan for the coming year that they become a more positive factor within the team. Um, and you could, depending upon what you have available in your organization, you may be able to, you know, set them up with coaching. Yeah, that's that, no, that's that's really great advice. Um, how do you deal with this? You know, some, some, somebody asked here recently in the chat. You know, how do you kind of like teach team steps up the ladder? Uh, I think uh, that is almost similar to this idea of how do you deal with you know some of these resilience issues going up the ladder. Let's say your your supervisor you know, or one of your leaders is that negative kind of presence. So in both ways, I'm wondering if the strategies are similar. Sure. Yeah, the, the, the phrase we hear often is manage up. How do we manage up? Yep. Um, yep. We need support from our leadership. We need their um, commitment to resources, to time, um, so that we can be successful with all of these efforts. And to manage up means that you have to organize and you have to have a constructive and positive message. So to manage up, you make sure that it's not one person because this is not one person's issue. Find your voice, bring together the group, and share the message in a very positive, respectful, and constructive way. This is not a time where we want to turn it into a let's attack leadership or let's criticize leadership, or let's tell them what a terrible job they're doing. Um, I, I, first of all, I think that we're, we're, we're way off base when we do that. I don't think that any leadership of any healthcare organization comes to work and says, how can I torture my staff? How can I make them right. miserable? Yeah. Um, they're doing the best they can. Um, oftentimes, they're doing things for the first time just like we are. This coronavirus thing right now, we're all winging it, and everyone's doing the best that they can. Um, so we need to understand that, yes, we need to give feedback up, and we need to help them understand what our needs are, but we need to do it in a way that forms collaboration and that allows us to work together cooperating and coordinating our efforts um, in a collaborative way um, so that we can be um, colleagues. You know, we're, we're, we, we, too often we form silos. Too often we form um, situations where we are combating one another rather than working together. Thanks, Bob. Um, so this is uh, one, one more question. Um, and I know we're almost at the end of time, uh, but we have a question here saying, you know, what's your advice in, in regards to using team steps and responding to, you know, kind of a health emergency in the hospital with frontline staff. And, and I know that that's a big answer and probably a webinar on its own. But what are those nuggets? What are, those th what are the, the top things that you would recommend to really help bring the team together to communicate better here and to stay safe in a, in a hospital-wide emergency like we're dealing with now? So the most important things with Team Steps in this situation are the two areas that we talk about all the time, communication and mutual support. You cannot over-communicate right now. Um, you want to make sure that your communication is clear, concise. Um, use SBAR when, when it's appropriate. Um, make sure that your handoffs are clear in between from one shift to another. A lot of people are working multiple shifts and, and having to, to cope with that. And mutual support. Look out for each other. Watch out for your brother's back and your sister's back. Make sure that you're supporting each other um, and that you are in this as a team and that we don't look at anyone and go, hey, you know, sorry you're struggling over there, but i got to go. No, 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 no. Yes. You're struggling. <laughs> Step over there and give them a hand. Thanks, Bob. All right. I know that folks might have more questions. There might be questions that, uh, you know, you think about in the next couple minutes or hours or whatnot. Feel free to email those uh, to team training 
at AHA.org, which is our, our address, and we will get those answered for you. Uh, for the time being, thank you all for taking time out of this busy day. Uh, again, I want to reiterate how thankful I am knowing that you're all out there doing this work and uh, how, how grateful everybody at the American Hospital Association is for all of our friends and family around the country who are doing this really important work right now. Uh, and then I'd like to also thank Dr. Bob Smith for uh, an amazing presentation and uh, for the very, very timely information he was able to give us. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes today's presentation. You may disconnect your phone lines, log off your webinars, and thank you for joining us this afternoon.